The update of Second Half Guidance was a bit of a shocker. So they guided to 80,000 ounces over the six month period we're currently in. So that previous midpoint was 112 and a half thousand ounces, which they'd reaffirmed just a month ago, almost 30% lower from a guidance that they'd reaffirmed one month ago. And on the cost front, they put forward an all in sustaining cost of US 1262 as a midpoint which is a 27% increase. I think it's pretty amazing how in one month you can go from you know, where they were to having production go 30% roughly the wrong direction yep. and cost 30% roughly the this is a great wrong issue, direction again. Right? Great yeah. is king. Oh, money mourners, Monday, well not Monday, bloody Tuesday, 5th of September, the mining news. Mate, she's, as per Trav's blackout theory, this, this industry is heating up at the moment. There's shit going on everywhere. I love it. <laughs> Love it. Good for business. <laughs> what a job we got, eh? <laughs> what a job, mate. How are you going? Oh, mate, I'm good. I'll just hook the barn me into me from uh, the Just Eats lunch bar. Beautiful. Not, Shout out to Q. Just a, just, you were, you're just an unofficial partner of the show because far out there feed me good each day. If, you, if you're in the district and you go get one, make sure you heard it from our show. And he might bloody give me some extra chilli on, or a bit, <laughs> a bit extra pork on the next one. Then he picks to become a, an official partner of the show if, if we get a oh. lifetime membership or something. Oh like no, that. I just want extra crackling <laughs> on the barn me tomorrow. If you're in the district, <laughs> if, he, if he doesn't mind, <laughs> mate, sensational boys. Fuck, we've got a bit to get through. Uh, a little late announcement, a bit more context on what we talked about about Bald Hill got dropped late yesterday, Avi from Minres. Yeah, get first right bit of, stuck into that. First bit of rock solid info from a from a a mining company to come out regarding that one. So, yeah, really keen to unpack that a bit more. Yeah. I think it's the third day in a row we're talking about it, but mm. some good info. Yes, and plenty more speculation on the way from myself. What else we got? A bit a of doubt, Tieto. Mate. Yeah, Tieto. I think between those two we'll, we'll be pretty busy t- today. Tieto is one that I've followed for, for quite a while, but I'm not sure we've actually had the chance to speak about it. <clears throat> Excuse me, speak about it on the show so far. So they're ramping up the Abuja project in the, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, or also known as the Ivory Coast. So mm. we'll unpack that one mm. in a bit. Nice. Trav, how's our bloody Spotify rankings looking, mate? You're all over this shit. We <laughs> uh, need some more stars, eh? Oh, that's pretty good, mate. I think we've got like 200 five-star um, reviews on there on Spotify, which is pretty awesome. Um, but we could always we could always use more, mate. So if the can always use more. <laughs> if the money miners want to uh, chuck us a five-star on there, on whatever app they listen to, be it Spotify or, or uh, Apple, on the Apple one, if you actually leave... A, a comment in words. It um actually it's it, that's the way to do it. Just just say I like you guys and give it five stars on <laughs> Apple. But Spotify, you only have to tap the five star button. Yeah, right. Just bloody sort us out. <laughs> Love would be a better word to use, I think, than like. And but all the people that have clicked it, we appreciate the money minus support. We sure do. And speaking of love, Matty. Oh, love. Do I bloody love these two companies? Like, yeah. Yeah, just personally, I loved them before they were partners. K Drill, RC Drilling. Experts, I think the RC in the context of K-Drill stands for really competent. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. really competent drillers. Right. Especially like at the helm of um, learning from the wisdom of Rhino Sullivan, like years and years of ore finding and getting the best out of drilling and shift changes. I think he studied I, like 25 years you know, from the time he was about four years old to become <laughs> become an expert driller, didn't he? He's actually the only man in Australia with a tertiary degree yeah. in exploration drilling. Yeah. From the um, yeah, Kalgoorlie yeah. School of Business. Yeah. True story. Yeah. This is the type of people you're dealing with at RC, uh, K-Drill. Get in touch with them. RC drilling experts, <laughs> bloody gurus in the district. And speaking of other gurus. Terra Capital. Terra Capital. Bloody great friends of the show. Um we're can't, too, we can't too. send people back enough to listen to the Rare Earths podcast. It's just going to second that. Um, hey, DK, give you a pat on the back for your EV calc on uh, Hastings yesterday too, Trav. Did he? In, I in didn't the, see that. In the WhatsApp group, mate. Oh, mate, I, bloody, bloody, I can't keep up. This mm. is the le- – like, like terror are good, Trav's good as well. Oh, this is the sort of <laughs> level we're dealing with. So <laughs> thanks, thanks to your support, K-Drill and Terry Capital. I promise I won't kiss you in public. Uh, <laughs> right, boys, let's get into it. Minres, their implementation agreement – with Alita Resources for the Bald Hill Project came out late yesterday afternoon. Take it away, gents. What's it all mean? What didn't we know yesterday that we know now? That's it. So, I mean, I guess at this point yesterday when we spoke about it, it was still rumours. We'd, we'd read in street talk that 
Minres were imminently announcing a deal, but we didn't have any uh, confirmation for from the company itself. So we've got some rock solid info. And as a quick reminder, Alita Resources have a wholly owned subsidiary which owns and operates the Bold Hill my mine in the in the south in the gold fields of I reckon you're Western the only Australia. man in Australia that pronounce it bold hill. You say it different to me. <laughs> Money miners, who's right? Let us know. Bald hill. We, we could chat all day about pronunciation, you and me, Maddie. <laughs> pronunciation, isn't it? Slightly different <laughs> pages there. Okay, so Minres reached an agreement with the deed administrator, which is of Alita, which as we spoke about yesterday was McGrath Nickel. And as a quick reminder why this is such a big deal, when the DFS came out and when Alita first started producing, they were talking about 155,000 tonnes per annum of spodumene concentrate plus a bit of tantalum. So they got a resource of 26.5 million tonnes at 1% lithium oxide, but they were producing. That's the the key detail there. So Citigroup put out a note, I think yesterday or today, it might have been this morning, modelling Bold Hill at 140,000 tonnes per annum of spodumene concentrate at 6%, 6%, and they ascribed a value of Aussie $1.2 billion to the asset using a spodumene concentrate, 6% again, price of US $1,200. So that, And that's a bit lower than we've seen others using 14 and we've calculated that oh, the research that came out yesterday about Liontown, uh, Albemarle's bid for Liontown was at, at a $1,900 yeah. price forecast. So that's, forecast. that's yeah. on the more conservative sides yeah. of uh, valuations Jay, did, we've used. Did they, did they model that on a standalone basis or were they factoring in uh, any synergies with Mount Marion or anything like that? The, the note <laughs> spoke at length about synergies with, you know, factoring the whole operation, I guess, that – Minres have in play in the gold fields. They they mentioned all their other shareholdings, which we'll get into later. You know, we've seen deals with Essential, Pantoro, Global Lithium, a whole range of um, yeah. you know, majority uh, minority rather interests that Minres have. So there was a there was a punchy comment, and this sort of relates to comments we'd made regarding the relationship between the administrators and the receivers. So McGrath Nickel and Cordamentha. So one of them stood out was that KM acts in the interest of foreign-owned Austroid, not the shareholders of Alita. So that's the words from Minrez. So this is the exact hostility that we were uh, talking between those various parties all arranged in, um, in, a, in a company that's in receivership. Okay, so where, where's this leave Alita, JD? Are there, there was talks about they have to be put into liquidation. Yeah, so the, the, there's that. a court hearing later today and essentially Alita needs to be put into liquidation for the sale process to go ahead, which is what Minrez and the administrators are trying to achieve. Not sale process, but for the for the transaction to be executed. There is no sale process and that's the wow. <laughs> that's the issue, yeah. right? To, yeah. For Minrez to get their yeah. hands on, yeah. on the asset. Yeah. So Minrez state that they'll pay out the secured debt and thereby acquire Alita's interest in the mine. And they state it will result in a material return to Alita. And this is subject to an independent expert valuation. So is, as in valuation, valuing the project, project to see how much they're going to pay. Yeah. I, we don't have the actual, you know, sale documents, but it appears that one of the conditions of how much is to be paid, the consideration is tied to some whatever an independent expert um, determines the value to be in some, some 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 mathematical way. It's fascinating, right? Because the material return to a leader is the interesting point. There's so much interest in this um, process because there are shareholders of a leader that do believe that they have some residual claim to the the value here um, as as part of like this this project's been in in, um, in limbo for so long, right? My question to you guys is: do you, do you think the best way to determine the value of this asset is for an independent expert? To value it, or do you think an auction is the best way to value this asset? I think quite clearly a sale process would be the the best way to find you know the the true value. And what to to confirm why isn't there a sale process? That's been that is one pushed, of the big, pushed one, by the receivers. That is one of the big que- well, un- unanswered questions that that because sort of remains. The sale process may take longer, and the receiver will not get their money as quick. I mean, the thing's dragged on for four years now. So we just don't really know, do we? Yeah. That's the unanswered question. Like it's, mm. yeah. There's a few other takeaways that I had. So one is that it's great and kind of hilarious to see Ellison and Minrez continue to pressure the Aussie government at every opportunity that they get. So if they're not pressuring them about 
getting support to help fund downstream lithium projects in Australia. They're putting on the soft press, you know, and a quote from today's announcement, see the profits generated and taxes and royalties paid in Australia to the benefit of the Australian taxpayer. So that's a, um, a bit of a go at the royalty and off, off take rather, you know, and royalty avoiding that they are accusing the, the current owners of doing. So they you, go- You imagine this, like you imagine that, that Minres's acquisition, one of the conditions might also be to, to restructure that off take agreement in some way that is, you know, better than it is currently- Abs- absolutely. So they go one step further and suggesting the Aussie government should intervene if certain foreign entities remain in control. Yeah, was it FATA, that the Foreign Transaction Authority or something? Yeah, they saying were mentioned. They should intervene if this doesn't go through. Yeah, so they were they were mentioned. So you raised a question that I had and I had a few more questions. This announcement didn't really help to, to answer. So, I mean, to reiterate, why haven't we seen a sale process? That is perhaps the biggest question I have. And sort of leading on from that, why has Minres managed to, to win out? I'd be fascinated to hear why. Another question is what return are shareholders going to see? That's all up in the air still. And it appears that Alita for, for quite some time could have been operating profitably. So I'd be interested to learn why there was no possibility of a, a relisting or anything like that. I'm sure there's perhaps a reason on that front. I'd just be interested to learn. As we just touched on, what, what's going to happen to the offtake agreement? Minres are clearly not going to be happy if they're having to get this asset and then sell it and sell the concentrate for 60% below market price. That's just a, a no-go. And I'm sure, as we've already seen, the Australian government isn't quite happy with that. And one last question I had is the uh, the share price reaction from Minres has been pretty muted today. They were, they were off a couple of percent, given it's a bit more of a marginal transaction given the scale mm. of Minres. But, you know, price depending, it should represent a bit of value if they manage to scoop it up for, you know, less than it's worth, which it kind of feels like they might be able to achieve. If you pick up a hotly contended asset without actually competing, mm. <laughs> mm. Like you imagine, you imagine, you know, it's, a, it's on like better than reasonable terms to them. Absolutely. So the only counter is that the uh, share price over the past, you know, couple of weeks did tick up somewhat from the, you know, the 60s to the, to the low 70s dollar per share for, for Minres. So perhaps people had been anticipating this in in and around all the rumours that we'd addressed last Friday in the change of ownership of Bold Hill. Is there, is the, one of the key things about this, as you said, the, the unknowns and the way it's transpiring is the function and argy-bargy between McGrath Nickel and Cordamentha, is it, the roles they're playing, like is that the big What's yeah. creating a bit of spice in this whole story? I think that is absolutely right. But it's not just the argy bargy between Cordamantha and McGrath Nickel. It's um it's what's the extension of that argy bargy? Well, it's also all of the shareholders of Alita, um, all of the, you know, the creditors beyond the unsecured creditors. It's everyone who stands to make something, including the other bidders that haven't been allowed in the process. I mean, you saw what looked like Glencore leak an article to the Australian um, a week or so ago because they weren't allowed to look in the door. Yeah. Um, well, that's what it, it read like to me. Um, so there's all of that, all of those parties that have some sort of interest in an outcome here, mm-hmm. and um, and to some of those parties, it feels like the process might not have been the best process. Um, but you kind of like you look at it and you think. Um, your fingers are going to be pointed. They're going to be pointed to the people running the process. They're not going to be pointed at Minerais. You have to respect the hustle, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. I what mean, they're, they're just doing what everyone wants to do. <laughs> we, we read yesterday that over 10 parties have tried to acquire the thing. Mm. They're, they're just the ones that look like they're going to win out. But it's a fly on the wall job, isn't it? So, <laughs> sure much, is. uh, so many unknowns. What, do, what about Minerais? What do you think? What do you think about in perception in the market at the moment with all this happening? And I guess they you know, Mr. Ellison's vision of doubling the business. Yeah, there's. I think there's few companies out there at the moment, in particular in the resource space, that divide opinion as much as Minres. Like some people absolutely love them, and you know, yeah, you see the exact opposite of that as well. He's, um, you know, I've got a, I've got a lot of time for founder-led businesses. He's built this business from the ground up. He's done a phenomenal job, and I think, you know, I think there is pretty solid data to show that founder-led businesses do perform. Better and I think he's a he's a great example of that. I I do want to shout out. There was an interesting video about a ten minute long video that Minres actually put out, and it was a bit you know behind the scenes in the life of 
Chris Ellison. It was a, mm. a really interesting yeah, watch good. for a um for a, quite a private man. So we'll we'll chuck that one in the show notes for people Because he does that it, he's not a person that goes on podcasts or anything. So it was actually good <laughs> no. to get a bit of um a bit of insight into his into the person. Yeah. Um, it was um yeah, no, it was good. It was only went for nine minutes. They did it very quickly, but it was <laughs> yeah. yeah, I watched it as well. A lot of respect for it. Not on a podcast yet, mate. Mm. <laughs> Just yet. <laughs> We'll wind him down eventually. I need a contact in there. I'll message one contact in there. He won't reply to my messages. <laughs> I am trying. We'll Maybe, get there. We'll get there one day. You went really into the uh, into the weeds on, on the whole region today. You were looking at like you know, oh, who you know has – I like to do this, eh? Yeah. I mean you were really sort of looking, okay, what's the play here from a strategic lens and all of these um, – all of these stakes that Minrez ha- have in these juniors around them. What, what did you decipher? Well, and it's probably more deciphered one little one that's been forgotten about and doesn't get mentioned too much. So we've got the we've got the map here of you know you've got the Global Lithiums Manor, you've got Mount Marion, you've got Pioneer Dome, um, West Spargaville. So Minrez are in a JV there as well. I didn't I didn't look too much into that. Bald Hill, obviously the one in question, um, but then you got you got pine within that little triangle there. You look at where Bald Hill is. You've got Pioneer Dome Essential Metals, which developer are, are taking over, and Minres are in a share uh, are a shareholder of as well. Then you've got Boldania, Line Towns, Boldania doesn't really hasn't really been talked about. It's like it's a little not they, a, they not have a another forgotten, asset, right? Not a forgotten soul. Yeah, I think this is their Boldania is their smaller one. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. 15 million ton at 1%. Um, but on, on that note, it would be interesting to see what happens to Baldania, and I'm sure you're going to get into it more. Yeah, and, and remember that, and if you zoom in on this map, you've got the the orange bit there, which is Line Town's part of the tenement, but then you've got the blue bit, which is Baldania as well, but that's under a like a farm in with Minres, Pantoro and Tulla. Just Pantoro now, just they well, consolidated. Just, now the just, merge is done, yeah. yeah. Just Pantoro, sorry. Yeah. I bloody read, read something. Oh, God, you bloody forget about some things, don't you? Too <laughs> yeah. much. Yeah, so and this just, is exactly what I was speaking to at the, the top of the show. Their their whole Goldfields area plan becomes a bit more clear now if they if they do manage to finalise this deal for Bold Hill. Mm. So I guess what's happening in that region and all the links, I know I've gone into it before, but, like, you know, you've got developing the process of acquiring essential metals. We've just spoken about... Min, min Resources being the front runner at the moment to take Bald Hill. Um, Mineral Resources owns 13.5% develop and they've also got that farming agreement with Pantoro for their both side of the Baldania project, which is a, a butts to Lion Town's um, thing. It's all connected as one Baldania. So it's all it's all went quite a bit down there. Like they released the Mineral Resource 2019, it was 15 million tonne at 1% lith. Uh, then in March 2022, because all their focus was on Kathleen Valley, obviously, why we'll put the attention down here, they did some further drilling. So they did some, I think they did some extensional drilling for their and deposit. Well, that's what's contained in the mineral resource. But then there's also this Northwest Prospect. Um, and they did, got some drill results back from there. So like, you know, five metres at 1.3, 10 at 1.1. And it looks, based on the outcrops and where these intersections are, that looks like to be a a lot more steeply dipping ore body, um, not in, not included in the resource, but there is that uh, they haven't really done anything on that on that area since. So when, when you say steeply dipping, Maddie, I always think underground. Underground, how bloody good is it? You know, I'll <laughs> venture towards the underground. Um, I guess where am I going with this? You'd, I, I just don't think Boldania can be forgotten about from a I guess an M and A perspective. It's it's right in the mix of that. For that very small lot, that region is like classed as one region, but if you talk about the smaller region around Bald Hill, the closest ones are Pioneer Dome, Essential, which will soon to be develop, um, and you've got Baldania. As you see, it's a bit of a close triangle. So, and Min Res have got, you know, they've got their fingers in develop, they've got their fingers in, um, in everything, in Baldania with the Pantoro side of it, and you, but you've got Line Towns one sort of sitting there. So should should Albemarle the Albemarle deal go through with Line Town? I guess the question is, will they will they keep Baldania? Will they will they divest it out? Um, you look at you look at the poten- exploration potential 
uh, with that northwest prospect of being a steeper dipping ore body. That to me brings develop into play to be be a function of consolidating that region in in and around very close to to Bald Hill. So and there you could class them as a partner of Minres with the with the shareholding and Minres are elected to vote in favour of the essential deal. So there is a there is a bit of an alliance forming there. So I reckon watch this space with Baldania to see what happens there. I, you wouldn't think anything had happened soon in the middle of a takeover no. offer. No. But will it be divested out and what's going to happen there? And would they be able to, if they're purely relying on a lot more exploration potential, um, will they pick it up pretty cheap and uh, who knows? So I, I, I think I'll keep an eye on it. I can't imagine um, – Minres picking up Baldania cheap. And the fact that it's been held on to sort of unencumbered by Minres all this time tells me that um, Liontown probably just didn't let Minres ever kind of look at it properly because look at Minres there on every other logo on that um, mm. slide there, including the tenements adjacent to Baldania by virtue of that farming agreement with Bantoro. So they clearly, you know, had some interest in in that um, specific deposit area. So flip flip around what I'm saying, Trav. Yeah. What do you think the power of Baldonia would be for Albemarle? Well, I just I, – I see Liontown's strategy of just holding onto it despite it not actually being a core asset. It's just yeah. like, well, you know, Minres is getting more and more active. So the value of Baldonia goes up and up and up. Yeah. You don't have to do any work for that value to go up because Minres is doing all the yeah. – you know, showing their hand that they want everything in the region, right? So mm. holding onto it and doing nothing, actually the value keeps going up. Um, yeah. So for Albemarle um, – they can choose to hold on to it, um, you know, longer, and then maybe the value keeps going up. It's just like a bit of a, it's a bit of a free kick, a free option. Um, Albemarle, do they really need the cash that comes from selling it? I mean, if they get a knockout offer, maybe they'll, they'll sell it. But um, but, but if you look at the value of essential, what develop, what they pay for that about hundred was it one hundred and fifty mil, yeah, something along that lines. That Ish. scheme, yeah. Um, this is pretty a bit more tons, but a bit lower grade, so pretty equivalent. But as you said, uh, supply and demand. Like, mm. well, if they picked it up for 150 mil, it wouldn't be a bad job. Mm. Um, but who know, Who knows? Will it be Minres would have, would develop look there? But there looks like a bit of a potential consolidation around a bit extra supply to go into that Bald Hill mine. Yeah, hard to predict what Albemarle will do. Watch this space. Mm. Should we chat about Tieto, guys? Leader away, Tieto. Give us a bit of context on you talked about Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, it's Côte d'Ivoire. Côte. That's it. Fuck That's it. I know. <laughs> so as we touched on at the top of the show, they've got the Abuja gold mine in what's also known as the Ivory Coast in West Africa. So they came out with second half guidance for, for the second half of this year, as well as a production schedule up until 2030. And on the back of that, they're down 25%. So the market's not taken a liking to it. You want to know a fun fact about Ivory Coast? Sure. It's one of those, it's a good trivia thing when you put up, name this flag. You put it up, you think Next it's the island, island flag, yeah. but the the orange and the green are around the other way. It's yeah. the Ivory Coast. Good trivia one. Don't fall one. for it if you go to a trivia night. <laughs> so Tieto announced also that they'd produced 11.1 thousand ounces in August at an average ga- grade of 0.9 grams per tonne. So that's a, that's a pretty low grade, especially when you take into account that their reserve grade is 1.3 grams per tonne. So we'll delve into that reconciliation difference. I've seen this before somewhere. Mm, <laughs> ramp up issues. Yeah. So Tieto finished August with 44 million in cash. So that leaves them after the 25% markdown at a market cap of $360 million. And they've also got US 19 million in debt. That was a working capital facility with Chorus Bank, which started at US 25 million. They paid off six and a bit. So the update of second half guidance was a bit of a shocker. So they guided to 80,000 ounces over the the six-month period we're currently in. It's a long way off where they provided the range before, isn't it, J.D.? So that previous midpoint was 112,500 ounces, which they'd reaffirmed just a month ago, almost 30% lower Mm. from a guidance that they'd reaffirmed one month ago. And on the cost front, they'd put forward an all-in sustaining cost of US 1,262 as a midpoint which is a 27% increase. So, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it's pretty amazing how in one month you can go from 
you know, where they were to having production go 30% roughly the wrong direction yep. and cost 30% it's, roughly the this is a wrong issue, direction again. Right? Grade yeah. is king. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, so got, yeah, production lower, cost, unit cost higher. It's all, it's all related to grade reconciliation, isn't it? It's all One, 100%. And there's a line in the, in the first page or the second page of the announcement today that really stood out. Tieto completed more than 15 kilometres of grade control drilling during July and August at a closely spaced pattern of 12.5 metres by 6.25 metres. So it's long been a critique of Tieto that they hadn't done enough grade control drilling and they didn't have, you know, enough geological confidence and an understanding in the ore body at a high enough level and you know you to follow that critique on it was always going to lead to issues with mining if you if you ask certain people who had an, an opinion of the the stock and you know to to what they'd thought i'd heard that argument a year ago more than a year ago and it's playing out exactly that way yeah you can look at some of the brokers that initiated on this stock at various points during its um development cycle and um a recurring theme in some of those initiations some of them initiated with sales mm-hmm. um a common a common theme was uh, issues with with the resource that that some of these brokers had, and the the company captured themselves perfectly in today's announcement in quotation marks. Grade control drilling confirmed by mine to mill reconciliation for August twenty twenty three resulted in the same amount of contained metal, but contained within ten percent more ore tons. So further on that point, so the grade's gone down. How does it? I'm so confused by that statement. <laughs> Could be a density thing as well. That's another thing that can that can change. So a bit a bit further on that point, I believe, you know, and to what you just said, Trav, this is one of the key reasons that most of the funding for the project was done by uh, equity funding as opposed to a more standard mix of debt and equity. Yeah, I'm, I'm keen to add a bit of colour on that uh, point, JD. I mean, for, for context, on the 16th of November 2021, Tieto announced that they had mandated Taurus to provide up to US $140 million of debt of the $200 million US stated CapEx, right? Um, so this is 16th of November. A week later, they raised $85 million in equity and called themselves fully funded. So there's your debt and equity mix. It's not It's not a, um, like I, I read that uh, Taurus mandate. It's not like the money's there, the facility's available. They just mandated Taurus to provide a facility. So I assume at that point, it's still subject to conditions, due diligence, et cetera. Um, so then, um, then, then Tieto was still talking about the Taurus step mandate on the 15th of March, 2022. So months and months later, right? And then your birthday. <laughs> hey, uh, and only 10 days after your birthday, Maddie, they went into a trading halt and raised $130 million equity, stating that their new strategy is now to fully fund project development with no debt um, and that the placement replaces the existing mandate with Taurus. So in September, uh, they topped up again with another... 49 million dollar placement this time it was to a chinese gold company and the very like the very public pivot in strategy here from a from a financing perspective going from the debt and equity mix to an equity equity only um to me it really just like begs the question i don't think we're going to get answers on this one but like what why pivot from from debt and equity to only equity you you, if you ever model your returns per share to equity it's higher the more you gear it as long as your um, IRR is, is higher than the cost of debt. Uh, so it's like a very public pivot in, in strategy. And I just I just wonder, like, did the debt financiers not get comfortable? Um, you know, like that's the open-ended question that I have that I, I don't think we'll get, we'll get an answer to. So on the production schedule, the other part of the announcement today, Tieto still expect to mine roughly 170,000 ounces for the next seven years at an all-in sustaining cost of just under US 1,100 Per ounce. So when you compare that to the DFS, which I think came out in October 2021, it's slightly more ounces, but at a significantly higher cost than that DFS outlined. And another aspect of the the company that we frequently get asked, and especially when we talk about Africa in general, is the the jurisdiction. So I think I think it's worth touching on. We've heard a lot of you know negative stories come out of the likes of Sudan, Niger, Mali, uh, similar sort of nations over the past couple months. But I actually look at Cote d'Ivoire as one of the better African jurisdictions. It's obviously West Africa, and you get all the um, you know issues that come with that. But there are companies like Endeavour, Barrick, Perseus. They all have operations in Ivory Coast, and they all seem to be going quite well. Did Ivory Coast used to be the name? Now it's Cote d'Ivoire, or 
it's the same thing or? Yeah, th- they speak French there. So Côte d'Ivoire is oh, the, Ivory Coast in French, oh, right, I believe. Right, now. So like I said, I want to touch on the outlook for Tietos. So they've got a reserve statement coming out this month and it's one I'm going to be quite keen to see. So with that initial uh, additional drilling that we've seen, I wonder if the, the grade drops off in comparison to previous reserve grade as they potentially realise it's not feasible to extract this gold at a one3 grams per tonne rate. So in other words, do we see a reserve downgrade? On the milling front, they've said they're targeting 5.5 million tonnes per annum, which is quite a jump up from the mill, which was built at a 4. Uh, 4.0 million tonnes per annum rate. So they announced in today's statement that they're looking at de-bottlenecking the, the mill to achieve that. Mm. There are a couple other red flags, which I'm pretty keen to talk about. And unfortunately, they are concerns that we talk about a little bit too much. So One of them is one of our, our favourite red flags. One of our favourite. And yeah, like I said, I think we just speak about it way too much in the mining industry, but it's hard not to look past the founder and the previous managing director, Dr. Cajun Wang, retiring from the board on May 30th. So MDs, founders, CEOs of companies don't generally leave during ramp up for no reason. Is that becoming not true, but because it seems that like they do now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we've got no assumptions to make here, Maddie, about the cause of um, doc, Dr. Cajun Wang resigning. But it's just, it's like, it always just begs the question. And we, we just see it as like a, a massive red flag in our own internal evaluation. Um, when we're like ramp up is such like a, a critical point in time for a developer, um, you know, like execution matters so much, things can go horribly wrong. What the outcome for shareholders is so, um, so, so like polarizing can either be awesome or horrible. And, um, you really want continuity of leadership throughout that period because things are so fragile. Yeah, it's a red flag. It's something to look into. And then, you know, in addition to that, Francis Harper, the chairman, sold 750,000 shares. Granted, that is less than 5% of his shareholding. And he did mention that that was to cover tax liabilities. And there was one more concern I wanted to talk about, and that relates to stockpiles. So, The company flagged that they have a lack of stockpiles, which could hinder performance and perhaps has hindered performance over the past couple months. So they flagged that equipment had had been held up at customs and that certainly wouldn't have helped them being able to do the the pre-stripping and some of the mining. And I know you looked into this a bit more, Maddie. What did you find out with regards to stockpiling? You've got to infer a bit, I guess. But look, if you're wanting to run the mill above nameplate, that's all well and good, but you need the mining to deliver that rock to run that mill at a high run rate. As you said, they, it was designed for four million tonne. They want it to run at five and a half. So if you want to run it at five and a half, you've got to find an extra one and a half million tonne of ore yep. in in a year to chuck it through the mill. So look. And it needs to be factored in and around the, the various seasons. You have quite a wet season in yeah. tropical parts as well. So there might be hiccups yep. during the wet season. It all needs to be built into the to the mine plan. Yeah. So if you've got a if there's a lack of stockpiles, it means they're milling quicker than they mine, uh, which then, when you get in that position, you don't have I guess flexibility, especially if you're blending ore on the rom. Like there might be, depending on how the ore bodies work, you might have a like a high grade, a low grade, and a or something. And there's like a could be five buckets of high grade, three buckets of low grade is the mix, and that's going on. But if you if your stockpiles are empty and you're waiting on trucks to get up there to do it, it just buggers the whole thing, makes everything difficult. So overall, if you want to if you want to bloody run at a high nameplate, you need to guarantee the dirt's coming up. So, if, But if you've got troubles at customs and you've got a, a wet season that has possibly impacted production, um, puts you in a shitty little spot. So Agreed. It's, uh, it's all about having a the, – the secret to mining is having a very smooth production profile, not big spikes and lows and spikes – if you're the best operations are the ones that just consistently perform. Yeah, and they had tried to address this with the the production schedule. The previous schedule was much more varying. It was, you know, on a per annum basis ranging between 80-odd thousand and 200,000, and it's a much steadier, you know, between 160 and 175,000 ounces per annum over the next seven years. So they are trying to address that. Perhaps, you know, whether that's achievable, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Beauty. Good stuff, boys. Right a couple, couple sponsors to thank. Oh, geez. Oh, I just can't wait for tomorrow because there's just going to be more news. <laughs> it's just flying at the moment. Sure oh, is, mate. Next year is going to be a big year. I feel it. Oh, M- just on the decline. M&A. <laughs>
<laughs> Love it. Especially when all more things start coming true. Right, our partners, we mentioned K-Drill and Terra Capital at the top of the show. Yep, anytime. Absolute GCs. Anytime yeah. exploration services, got to thank them. JP Search. JP Search, they're getting a bit of bloody, might be getting a bit of business from us. Bloody tell you what. Mm, and Top Drill, lastly, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, get on Spotify, eh? Click that star. Give us some stars on Spotify. Subscribe on YouTube. Do, and if you're not, if you uh, yeah, because there's still about, what, over bit under half of the people that watch on YouTube aren't subscribed. So yep. And if you've got any feedback, get in touch, get in the comments, email us, join the Hooteroo chat, let us know what you reckon. There's not a lack of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> More is better. Right, Righto, money miners, Hooteroo. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.